conversation with retired Admiral James Stavridis. The U.S. ambassador to China says the United States is now ready to hold high-level talks with Beijing. Speaking at an event yesterday, Ambassador Nicholas Burns said the U.S. wants to develop, quote, better channels between the two governments. NBC News reports he also said while the relationship is complicated, the United States does not seek conflict with China, and that dialogue would be more constructive. Can't argue with that, Admiral. It would be more <laughs> constructive, but why do you suspect this message is being sent right now at this moment from the United States? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, Nick Burns, somebody I've known a long time, he was our ambassador to NATO. Um, so he understands how complicated this international scene is. The reason we, the United States, are making <clears throat> these overtures right now, Willie, is pretty simple. It's because um, the relations have really cratered over the last uh, six months, everything from spy balloons to worsening trade to cyber conflict to arguments about the South China Sea. So none of that is good for the global environment. The, and here we also get to Ukraine. We want Russia to we want Russia not to get support from China. The best way to do that is to have good relations, reasonably good between China and the United States. So there's a big game of risk afoot here. Um, Admiral, um, it's, it's so interesting. I was at a global citizen event last week and interviewed President Macron. And here we're talking about the things that he thinks need to be done to, to help on, on the issue of climate change. And at the top of his list is the United States and China getting together and starting to talk again. He said it's one of the reasons he went there on the trip that was seen as controversial. He said, we've got to break the ice. Yeah. And, and it is true, is it not? If we're worried about global security, if we're worried about Ukraine not escalating into World War III, if we're worried about climate change, if we're worried about the economy, if we're worried about trade, if we're worried, again, again, let's underline it again, global security, the United States has to talk to China, regardless of what Trump Republicans are saying and regardless of what some people on the far left are saying. We have to talk to them. Indeed, we do. And here's how I would categorize it, Joe. What we need to do is confront China where we must, where they're flying spy balloons over the United States, where they claim the entire South China Sea, a body of water half the size of the United States, is territorial waters. It's a preposterous claim. We need to confront China where we must, but we should cooperate wherever we can. And you just ticked off the shopping list. It's the environment. It's cooperation and global security, trying to resolve the situation in Ukraine. I'll add one to your list. Prepare for the next pandemic. Part of why our global response was so disastrous is because it disaggregated the United States from China and others who were involved in it. So we should have a strategy that says confront where we must, cooperate wherever we can. That's the best policy. That's why Nicholas Burns is putting those feelers out. The next thing you'll see and watch for it will be cabinet level officials going to Beijing, look for Janet Yellen to go, our Secretary of the Treasury, look for Ginny Raimondo, former government of Rhode Island, and currently the Secretary of Commerce. That's the cooperate where we can side. We'll continue to confront where we must. And let, let, let's put this relationship in perspective. I, I hear uh, for people who who loathe Joe Biden, who are, her, who are overly ideological and it's all partisanship. They'll talk about how weak we are and how China's pushing us around and how this, uh, and it skews the debate. It goes against the reality of everything I've heard from leaders in Europe, leaders in the Middle East, leaders uh, in, 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 in Asia. They're all saying the United States is flexing their muscles more than ever before. And I'm not being jingoistic here. I'm saying American leaders, especially in Washington, need to look, and this is what Dr. Brzezinski always said, look at America through the eyes of our adversaries, through the eyes of our allies. And I can tell you right now, our allies and our adversaries are saying, we're not leading from behind anymore. You know, I'm check I always check out Morning Joe to see what's the latest propaganda and stumbled upon this here, this segment that is pure cope. Because some of the other segments that Nick and I have covered, you should hear how they're talking about China. 
trying to be tough on China. This very guest, this very guest that he has here, now this is a completely different sort of uh, perspective that he has, but it's complete cope. But let's listen to a little more because now Morning Joe, or I should say Joe Scarborough, is going to talk a little more. And it's amazing to me to hear some of his past segments and some of the things he says uh, here. So let's listen a little more to this conversation. Like our pivot to Asia has started and we've actually boxed China in. You look at what we've done in Guam, the increased force wow. there. You look at the increased force in the Philippines, the agreement there. You look at the nuclear sub agreement with Australia. You look. So Joe Scarborough is making an attempt. So this is what I think. I mean, the, the, the United States is obviously seeing what's happening around the world. You're talking about pieces breaking out in places that people would never have thought. You have them trying to negotiate or at least speaking to one side of the, I think, uh, speaking to uh, Putin. We have she speaking to Putin about a peace deal and a peace plan. Um, you have uh, these countries uh, now dealing in their own locale cu uh, currency. Uh, you got the BRICS banks and you got all of this happening. And <laughs> the United States is in panic mode. And, you know, there's there's a side of the ruling class that say, hey, we need to work with China, even steel uh, to keep making money because that's the market. But but anyway, let's listen to some more of what he says here. Uh, Morning, Joe. Let's rewind said, it 30 seconds. Look at America through the eyes of our adversaries, through the eyes of our allies. And I can tell you right now, our allies and our adversaries are saying we're not leading from behind anymore. Like, the, like our pivot to Asia has started and we've actually boxed China in. You look at what we've done in Guam, the increased force there. You look at the increased force in the Philippines, the agreement there. You look at the nuclear sub agreement with Australia. You look at the agreement with Japan to start uh, flexing their muscles and building their military out. China, and I'm not being critical of the Biden administration. Yeah. America's doing what America's been promising they're going to do for 20 years and never did it. We have pivoted to China. And we, we are we choosing to pivot to China. <laughs> Asia now than, than we've had. At the same time, and forgive me for this long buildup, but our policymakers that watch this show need to understand it. At the same time, China has a reason for feeling... <laughs> You know, a little tight around the collar. They have really? a reason for saying, my God, the Americans are starting to surround us. Starting. At least we can understand. <laughs> Star why starting, to, <laughs> starting to surround that us. And now he's saying maybe we should start. I guess, guess what he's, the, the cope is maybe we should start listening to some of what they're, they, they uh, are saying about uh, how they feel about our aggression. And, and, and uh, Joe Scarborough is saying, uh maybe we need to start so let's 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 back away from this and let's bring up this graphic here so the united states surround china with military bases they so this is a graphic illustrating military bases near china u.s military bases near china now, these bases didn't get built over the last few months, okay? Like Joe Scarborough is trying to pretend they didn't get built in the last couple of years even. I'm sure there's been some ad, ad additions here and there, but I'm saying for the most part, <laughs> these bases have been around. So I guess this is uh, the ruling class now saying we need to start publicly acknowledging what we've already been told and, and known for several decades um that we are bullies like, so now he's saying we need to start accepting that because they see uh hegemony slipping away so i guess maybe the aim is now is just to make sure they stay one of the leading countries at least i don't know how they would do that without joining BRICS. how, how would that happen could you imagine <laughs> the united states joining BRICS? All right, so let's let's go back to and there's another version. I have another version of this map. Let me see. But the but the United States says China is the one threatening them with spy balloons. While we meanwhile while we have all these bases surrounding them, 
it's a uh, it's it's a joke. But anyway, let's get back to the Morning Joe clip, and let's listen to more of this cope. Particularly, I'm just very gleeful to hear this from Morning Joe. This cult. Like our pivot to Asia has started, and we've actually boxed China in. You look at what we've done in Guam, the increased force there. You look at the increased force in the Philippines, the agreement there. You look at the nuclear sub agreement with Australia. You look at the agreement with Japan to start uh, flexing their muscles and building their military out. China. And I'm not being critical of the Biden administration. Yeah. America's doing what America's been promising they're going to do for 20 years and never did it. We have pivoted to China and we have a stronger presence in Asia now than, than we've had. At the same time, and forgive me for this long buildup, but our policymakers that watch this show need to understand it. At the same time, China has a reason for feeling... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, as I showed you in some the of the collar. graphics, they have a that reason for saying, "My God, the Americans are starting to surround us," and if at least we can understand why they're thinking that way, that helps us get 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 to the table and start talking about some of our disagreements instead of this 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 just reflexive anti-China movement on the Hill. Indeed, and. I'll add one to your list of how it looks from Beijing, which this you didn't mention, such, which is recently announced this guy is U.S. Such nuclear a submarines will be due for U.S. Uh, propaganda. This particular guy right here. Doing port calls in Korea. And oh, by the way, we have ships in and out of Singapore constantly. So yes, we need to put ourselves in the shoes of the other and therefore understand so their arguments. Amazing. For example, why they think they own the South China Sea. So I, I don't know if this is at all connected, like this cult, this worry is at all connected. Now, maybe this is cult because Beijing is not returning or taking their calls. I think Nick has done a couple of segments on this where uh, supposedly it's been reported that a lot of the high level people in uh, the uh, People's Republic of China or the uh, in China. OK, yeah. U.S. ambassador, uh, the high level talks. What I was getting to is the if you remember, there was a story or there several stories where uh, it was saying that high level people in the China government was not taking the calls from uh, people, even Joe Biden, and were not taking calls from anyone in the U.S. And then you see all of these things sort of happening, the things that the China, uh, China is is developing, peace talks and all of the uh, uh, Belt Road Initiative. They're going to talk about that in just a second. Um, so it's a fear, more of like, it feels like more, they want to get in contact with China because they're afraid of what's going on. It's kind of like, let me make sure I'm communicating with my enemy to kind of get a feel of what they're trying to do. And that's kind of what I think uh, is going on. But this is complete state media. I see I see you, Wyatt. I'll give you a couple of minutes there to get ready. Um, uh, and state, and this is completely state media. I see the comment in the uh, chat there. We're gonna agree with it, but because then we can reverse engineer those arguments, negotiate, and resolve some of these conflicts. All of that is crucial to diplomacy. Final thought, Joe, I hear a lot, you probably do too, that, oh my God, we're in a new Cold War with China. No, we're not. And, you know, Mike Barnacle and I are old enough to actually remember the Cold War. That was the Soviet Union, the United States and NATO. All right, so let's let's actually bring in our guest for the end of this segment because he may have something to say about some of this um, this China stuff, just broadly speaking. So this is a, a well-known guest that we've had on the network pretty often, international journalist, anti-imperialist journalist in particular. This is Wyatt Reed. Welcome, Wyatt, back to the network. What's up, bro? Good. Thanks for having me on. It's always a, a, an honor and a pleasure to be on with y'all. I came across this other segment on Morning Joe where it's pure cope about U.S. hegemony in China. It's basically where they're, they're there to say, hey, we need to talk. We want high-level talks. We got to talk to China. You know, we're they're now trying to make it seem like the United States is is voluntarily pivoting 
to China. That's kind of like what they're calling this rise in China. We're we're pivoting to China to, together. And I'll I'll bring back up the uh, clip to kind of uh, play a little more of it. But just broadly speaking, what is uh, especially since you are kind of like an international uh, journalist, so I know you're abreast of a lot of different stories. But so but so broadly speaking, what what is your take on just uh, U.S. hegemony and, and sort of uh, what China is doing, uh, brokering sort of peace deals, the Belt and Road Initiative. Just kind of broadly speaking, what, what do you think is, is going on and what is your opinion on all of that? Yeah, it seems like they're kind of trying to manage the narrative a little bit, right? Mm-hmm. They, the, the, yeah. the brief bit that I heard w- was kind of a an pretty fascinating admission. He says, you hear a lot about the new Cold War with China. Do you like? I I don't know where he's hearing that from. I hear it, you hear it because we right. are in this very anti-imperialist sphere. But the fact that right. somebody like that actually is apparently hearing, presumably behind closed doors, about you know this new Cold War with China, that mm-hmm. to me indicates that this narrative that I thought was just something that a handful of you know us weirdos on the internet were talking about, <laughs> radicals. Apparently, they're actually you know having this discussion themselves. Um, which on the one hand, you know, it's, um, you generally want your enemy to be, uh, let's say, you know, have less information than they need. And I do, I do think, you know, like I consider the U S regime, my enemy, and I think it considers me the same. And I, I would imagine you feel pretty similar. Yes, yes, yes. (laughs) But, uh, I was waiting but, for my tag, for our tag of yeah, like yeah. Russian state media or China, and then they took it up. But, but yeah, we were we were always expecting that to happen to us. But, but continue, Wyatt. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, so you know that that is the one aspect you on you on you honestly kind of wish. Like, I hope these guys don't really understand what's really happening in the rest of the world because that way they'll be less able to interfere with it and less mm-hmm. able to to prevent those processes from happening. Um, but I guess it is kind of at least reassuring t- on some level to understand like, okay, they, they at least acknowledge that this is something that's being said, that they're acknowledging this reality, even if it's only to try to debunk it. But they're at least like yeah. voicing these thoughts out loud. Um, you know, I think that's probably a beneficial thing. The more people hear this idea and are, are cognizant of this concept of like, okay, you know, one thing is to have a competition. Another thing is like great power rivalry. Um, you know, that is like real Cold War stuff. So I don't know. Obviously, the context here is that we've had a number of massive uh, breakthroughs in terms of international relations over the past couple months. We've had... Right, right. Uh, Iran and and Saudi Arabia, this kind of rapprochement where they hadn't had relations at all for the past seven years. Historically, going back decades, they have been very much rivals. Now they're sitting down, uh, they're opening wow, back up amazing. embassies. And uh, then you see, you know, the Saudis are meeting with um, the Houthis in Yemen, right? Uh, so all that's of this- really what of- surprised me. That That's one of the ones that really surprise me but continue sir well to me it shows that the saudis are a little bit smarter or more clever than you might give them credit for because like they're they're not stupid right they, they may be extremely self-interested but they're certainly not dumb they're looking around at the writing on the wall they're seeing the rest of the world they're seeing brazil you know all all these countries that were very recently firmly within the orbit of the united states are now de-dollarizing and they're switching their currencies, Mm -hmm. they're strengthening their own currencies, and they're simultaneously weakening the US dollars uh, control over the global economy. So, you know, they're the Saudis are looking at this and saying, hey, maybe it's time uh, for us to play a more productive role instead of basically being like the attack dog for the American empire, we should prioritize our own uh, strategic goals and prerogatives. Uh, instead of basically, yeah, a- acting a- as kind of a stand-in for U.S. interests in the same way that Israel um, has has done so for so long. Um, so, I mean, that to me is a meaningful shift because it shows kind of a shift in the self, uh, I, the, the self perception, right? Um, mm-hmm. in, in terms of what Saudi Arabia wants as a country. Well, now they 
they want to be a regional power and they, they realize that in order to be a regional power in their own right, they're going to need to have their own relations with everyone else in the region. Right. They can't just stand behind the U S the one uh, bully. So, <laughs> right, exactly. And then just, you know, it spit on, spit on the victim on the ground. I step in afterwards. Hey, you know, um, yeah. And to your, and to your point, um, this is another development here. This is president. I think you said, I think it's pronounced Rossi, President uh, Rossi arriving in Syria to this 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 grand uh, sort of uh, celebration of him uh, arriving. It's it's amazing what's what's uh, happening uh, to your point. But did you uh, also hear about this news here? I think it was reported on Cradle. Is this video? Let me see what it, where it's from. Um, hang on a second here. Yeah, sure. the Cradle breaking news. Uh, President Rossi. Uh, arrives in Syria, uh, in Syria's Damascus, um, Damascus. just, yeah, Damascus, um, just amazing. Another, another thing that to me, you know, I wouldn't say would not be possible. It just didn't feel like this was like next week. You know what I mean? It, it didn't right. feel like it was this close. Um, but can you speak to that point to the, like, what does it well, mean see, that it's happened so quickly since all of these peace deals, it's just one after another, like literally weeks apart. It kind of calls to mind this famous Lenin quote where he said that there are decades where nothing happens and there was weeks where decades happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, this this past couple of months has been full of weeks like that, where you just one thing after another, after another, after another. And so this this piece right here, I mean, this is kind of the um, this this reincorporation of Syria back into the diplomatic fold. Uh, something that seemed, as as you correctly pointed out, it seemed really far off uh, for many, many years. And, you know, e even just having the Iranian foreign minister, who's obviously a very close ally of of the uh, Syrian government, um, you know, they wouldn't necessarily be making trips in person to Damascus, even so, even, even being right. close allies. Um, right. You would but, send, but, like high level or maybe mid level people in your government to go represent you. So this is really big to your point. Go ahead. Well, to me, the, the, the most important thing is that Syria is kind of on the cusp of being readmitted to the Arab league that, you know, so Iran is one thing, but when the countries that have been propping up, have been pushing this proxy war in your country for years are finally willing to do the same, you know, when Qatar and Saudi Arabia, right still we're still turkey is kind of the main holdout right turkey is playing its own separate game there um but uh you know the rest of the arab the arab countries right all all pretty much of the arab countries are back at this point where they're now um trying to bring syria back into the fold and that's you know that to me that shows you how far we've come in in the span of a very short time because uh, yeah, this this would have been unimaginable very recently, um, but now we're gonna have a chance, I think, for Syria to get back on the right foot, and more importantly, for Syria's economy uh, to get back on the right foot, and and for Syrian people to be able to, uh, you know, start living yeah. their lives in a more normal way. That's that's the part that we all like here that are anti-imperialists. That's that last part. That's the part we're really fighting for is for regular people to, to not be involved. Uh, you know, you know, in these, these pawns. Sort of yeah, these p being played as pawns in these games for these ruling classes of, of all of these uh, countries. So but let's listen to a little more so we can close this segment out on China and the cope. I'm going to rewind it back to the beginning of where you said how it was very shocking. Uh, I forget the name of this guy right here, but um, what he says here. And let's just listen to the last two minutes. Um, if, you, if you would like now. Yes, yeah, sorry. go ahead. Yeah, I, I, if you if you want to stop it anywhere, if you hear something, hey, you want to comment on, just um, I cool. can't see you because I'm looking at the screen. So just let me know. Hey, so just stop and I'll, and I'll stop. Don't worry about interrupting. All me. right. Got it. All right. So here we go, guys. It's reflexive anti-China movement on the Hill. Indeed. And I'll add one to your list of how it looks from Beijing, which you didn't mention, which is recently announced U.S. nuclear submarines will be 
doing port calls in Korea. And oh, by the way, we have ships in and out of Singapore constantly. So yes, we need to put ourselves in the shoes of the other and therefore understand their arguments. For example, why they- th This is so amazing to me. And there's a couple of reasons to me why this is amazing. It's because this is a former NATO commander. Now I remember who this is, James Stardust. Stavridis, yeah. It's Stavridis, yeah. Uh, and <laughs> it's amazing that th he's coming on TV as a former NATO leader or commander and saying uh, we need to look at it from the position. And they're, they're admitting they're feeling like the little tight around the collar, maybe too many bases, maybe this and that is – it's not good what we're doing. He's kind of pointing out some aggressive things that the United States is doing that maybe maybe we should look at it from from their perspective. It, on the many levels, that's very shocking because he's a former NATO leader uh, and he's saying it publicly. And he's on this particular show, Morning Joe, which is really a show that a lot of elites watch for news. So that's why this to me is so... Shocking, but can you speak to the point of him being a former NATO commander? And he's this is I don't know is is this shocking to you? Is maybe I'm like being uh, overly exaggerating here? Maybe I bring it down, but this is very shocking to me for him for it to be coming from this particular uh, person, Wyatt. Yeah, yeah. Stav Riddis is really a, the warm. He's a warmonger's warmonger. He's he's the former NATO Supreme Allied Commander for Europe. And he's currently the vice chair of global affairs and the managing director at the Carlisle Group, um, which is, um, uh, how, how do I explain who the Carlisle Group is? Uh, that, it's kind of that. like a cabal of, of evil genius <laughs> that are secretly manipulating That's what global I was just events about to paint in the order picture to... of somebody going like this. You know what I mean? Like, it's just that. <laughs> uh, they're like, it's, it's like movie villain evil. Um, yeah, but I think I think really what what he's kind of pointing out here, pointing to, um, is less so that you know we need to be more empathetic and we need to try to put ourselves in you know China's shoes or whatever. Which is just you know any any time these guys have to like admit something that should be kind of obvious, they 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 give you like this little lesson in empathy one hundred and one. Like, well, you have to consider if you want to be a strategic genius like me, you have to consider what it's like, what that person might be thinking. Mm. It's like, no, this is extremely basic, you know, uh, sort of sort of uh, analysis. Is like, what is what is that that person thinking and why? This is just like geopolitical analysis one hundred and one. He's presenting it as though it's some kind of cool new trick he's come up with. Right. But uh, well, maybe but we really... should start considering their feelings like 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 you're being a better person. I'm being a yeah. better person now, you know, your right. country. <laughs> it's like, yeah, no shit. Yes, you should. You should be doing that. Um, but, you know, to me, this kind of it speaks more to this emerging consensus that I think you see on both sides of this divide between kind of the, the Democrats that want the Cold War with Russia and the Republicans that want the Cold War with China. You know, I think Stavridis has come down more on the Democrat side. Um, and this is a, a kind of a critique that I've heard from Republicans, like Matt Gates, and like, you know, I've heard this on Tucker Carlson's show many times. Where so he's of, like soft, like he's considered to be soft <laughs> on China. Is that well, what the critique is? <laughs> well, right. Well, right. No, that that their their problem with the other team's desired Cold War with X, Y, or Z country is mm -hmm. that it's going to leave us underprepared for my desired Cold War with the other. Country, oh, right. Gotcha. That's kind of so. That was what the, the Republicans are saying. Oh, our real enemy. It's not Russia. It's China. We got to stop with the proxy war against Russia so we can focus on Taiwan. You know, he seems to be making the same argument sort of from the other side or not making it, but he's 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 gesturing towards it in a way that I really haven't seen from um, from very many people on kind of the more Democratic side. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting development. Like I haven't seen so many Democrats push back on this. I've heard I heard Fareed Zakaria do this a couple of weeks ago where he kind of pointed out like, why are we going after China? We're undermining the U.S. Led sort of global economic order by doing all this, and 
Um, you know, I think there is a, a small segment of the ruling class that is making these arguments in public now just because it's beginning, it's getting to the point mm. where to not to do otherwise would be so far detached from reality that it can, you can be taken seriously. So we, we have to understand that when we say the ruling class, we bunch them all together. You know what I'm saying? But there are different groups of ruling class. They have disagreements right. on things. Right. And in particular, military sort of uh, military sort of action is where, since that's a large chunk of where the money is spent and, and used, that's right. one from where a lot of uh, a disagreement could flare up through media. Where you think it's just oh they just had no these are this is the ruling class mouthpiece just speaking their their side so to your point well, well they've been uh, united in in standing behind global american military and economic domination over the world for many many years but now i think it's the first the we're, we're hitting a point where not only is it obvious that the united states is no longer going to control the entire rest of the world um it's it's to the point where people need to strategize about around it mm. and so you do actually have fracture fractures that in the past were largely sort of superficial that i think now because they they really do reflect people's bottom lines and their own self-interest you know you're gonna i think see the knives start to come out uh, a little bit more whereas you know in the past it was kind of like oh we'll pretend to hate each other in public we all still go to the same, right, you know, same parties school, same, and whatever. Yeah. We send our kids to the same schools. But same island. Put on they this go to the show. same island all the time. <laughs> right. And I think now you're starting to get to a point where these these fractures could actually turn into something bigger and significant mm. and worth acknowledging and potentially even strategizing around. Absolutely. Uh, let's listen to a little more of this cope here. I'm loving it coming from this guy, so I, I got to hear a little more and then We'll get to the big news or the slightly bigger news, which is um, it's funny. We're talking about China in this segment and then we're going to be moving to Russia, the two, the other big country they're trying to poke the bear on. So let's listen. Poke the panda too. Yep. Poke the panda. That's a the best way. South China Sea. Not that we're going to agree with it, but because then we can reverse engineer those arguments, negotiate and resolve some of these conflicts, all of that is crucial to diplomacy. Final thought, Joe, I hear a lot, you probably do too, that, oh my God, we're in a new Cold War with China. No, we're not. And, you know, Mike Barnacle and I are old enough to actually remember the Cold War. That was the Soviet Union, the United States and NATO, millions of troops nose to nose on the Fulda Gap in Europe, huge battle fleets around the world playing Hunt for Red October, thousands of nuclear weapons on a hair trigger alert. We're not remotely there. We are still engaged. We need to continue that. We are still engaged. And Mike, you, you, you talk to any diplomat, you talk to any business person that has been to China over the past several months, and the Chinese will actually express concern. And the Chinese will actually ask, oh, wait, wait, why, right why does everybody in America hate us? And, you know, you bring up the spy balloon and they'll laugh. They'll go, oh, my God, your, your spy technology is light years ahead oh of God. ours. We have no idea how much you're, 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 you're raking out of China every day. And, and oh, so that's that pure cope right there. I'm wow. Oh, that was pure cope right there. Just ridiculous. Like, like they're, wow. they're saying, you're so much better than us. Why, why do you hate us? That's basically what he's trying to say. Well, but it's it's like that's I imagine that's kind of true. Like if I was a Chinese diplomat, I would probably ask them that too. Like so, like why why do so many people in right. your country hate us? Why do you say all this crazy stuff about us on the news all the time? You know, but it is but a then, fair I mean, it is a fair question. Yes, it is a fair well, it's like, question. It's like an, and I, and it's I like, do think they ask the question. But the way he's framing it here is to make yeah. it seem like uh, yeah, in a different a different something more to the meaning. But absolutely, well, that would be something you're asking. Like, what do we it's, do? It's kind we're, of we're like, <laughs> like listening to an arsonist outside of a burning building. Like, how did this catch on fire? You know what I mean? <laughs> like, that's that's what it's like listening to these people. Go, oh, why did uh, the Chinese where, think where we hate them? <laughs> yeah, right. 